Hi again. In the last segment of the rise of Adventism, the chapter has been talking about the uh, development of Seventh-day Adventism, and particularly about their attitude towards the Civil War, and how they framed everything by the descriptions in the book of Revelation. And here the chapter goes on this way. In 1858, Mrs. White published Volume 1 of Spiritual Gifts, which in a later amplified form would be the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Here the prophetess couched the slavery issue in eschatological terms. Of the three angels in Revelation 14 who hovered above the closing events of history, the second angel trumpeted that Babylon was fallen. That is, the organized churches, both Catholic and Protestant, were fallen, and the world was therefore on the decline. American slavery and the complicity of the American churches in slavery was a chief indication of a decaying world. In a chapter on the sins of Babylon, Mrs. White, and of course this is Ellen G. White when she was quite young, said this, quote, All heaven beholds with indignation human beings, the workmanship of God, reduced by their fellow men to the lowest depths of degradation and placed on a level with the brute creation professed followers of that dear Savior whose compassion was ever moved at the sight of, the, of human woe heartily engage in this enormous and grievous sin and deal in slaves and souls of men. God will restrain his angels but little longer. His wrath burns against this nation and especially the religious bodies that have themselves engaged in it. The cries of the oppressed have reached unto heaven and angels stand amazed at the untold agonizing sufferings which man formed in the image of his maker, causes his fellow man. Said the angel, the names of the oppressors are written in blood, crossed with stripes and flooded with agonizing, burning tears of suffering. God's anger will not cease until he has caused this land of light to drink the dregs of the cup of his fury until he has rewarded unto Babylon double. End of quote. Ellen White's Jeremiah on the State of the Union blended apocalypticism with radical republicanism. Like Lincoln, she saw Union setbacks at the first battle of Bull Run and elsewhere as divine judgments. Unlike the Lincoln prior to emancipation, she felt sure of the reason. God is punishing this nation, she declared in a testimony to the Church of 1862, for the high crime of slavery. He has the destiny of the nation in his hands. He will punish the South for the sin of slavery and the North for so long suffering its overreaching an overbearing influence." End of quote. The crux of the problem was that the North endeavored to save the Union without abolishing slavery. There were pro-slavery men in the high command of Northern ranks. The Joint Committee of, on the Conduct of the War, an arm of the Radical Republicans, had made accusations that Mrs. White could support in vision. The National Fast, though Seventh-day Adventists observed them, were actually an insult to God. This nation, she wrote, will yet be humbled into the dust. Ellen White, along with Andrews and Lowborough, these were also early Adventist leaders, could agree with Lincoln in the early 1860s that the American destiny was eschatological. America was indeed, as Lincoln had said, the last best hope of earth. It was the last because for Seventh-day Adventists there was no time left. It was the best because nothing better would follow in this world. It was the hope of earth due to right principles of Protestantism and Republicanism. But here Mrs. White and other Seventh-day Adventists diverged from Lincoln, for at this last hour of earth's history America was forsaking these great principles. Protestantism was mimicking Catholicism. Republicanism was dissolving into oppressive totalitarianism. A slave minority and an Adventist minority testified to that. For all Lincoln's fatalism, he could never opt for so grim an appraisal. America was failing, declared the Adventists, as democracy died a sordid death. As a consequence of the American failure, the end of time was imminent. America was, quote, the last best hope of earth, the best thing the world had going for it. But America was meanly losing this hope and thus triggering the apocalypse. Seventh-day Adventist eschatology involved a departure from Millerism in regard to the role of America. Both Millerites and early Seventh-day Adventists 
gloomily imagined America as, in turn, a demon and a dragon. But Millerites believed that the United States was an inherently evil government, while the Adventist successors opined that America had once been a good government and only lately had gone bad. In metaphorical terms, there was no love lost by Millerites for the Republic, but Seventh-day Adventists felt cheated in their love for America. America was a fallen woman now, incapable of love. So, for Millerites, the Republic was only incidental to the apocalyptic scheme, as one among many signs of the end. For Seventh-day Adventists, the nation was crucial to eschatology and appeared at the heart of their interpretation of the apocalypse. The Seventh-day Adventists, unlike the Millerites, drew upon political rhetoric to describe the national decline, and therefore may be termed political apocalyptics. The Adventists in this period remained entirely pessimistic about any form of political action, as did the apolitical Millerites, but they assumed a political platform in expressing their pessimism about America. During the Civil War, Adventists were generally radical Republicans, a popular political stance in their migratory homeland of southern Michigan. While a definition for the radical Republican is not easily agreed upon by scholars, Adventists would appear to have been radical Republicans by any definition. Uriah Smith, as editor of the Review and Herald, disdained Lincoln's policy of attempting to save the Union without freeing the slaves, and called it conservative, if not suicidal. Prior to emancipation, he lashed out at Lincoln that, quote, he has to stand up against the enthusiasm for freedom, which reigns in nearly 20 million of hearts in the free North, and against the prayers of four millions of oppressed and suffering slaves. If he continues to resist all these, in refusing to take those steps which a sound policy, the principles of humanity, and the salvation of the country demand, it must be from an infatuation akin to that which of old brought Pharaoh to an untimely end. End of quote. If Smith did recall this analogy at Lincoln's assassination, he regretted it. Radical Republican journals like The Independent were read by Adventists, and lengthy articles and speeches were excerpted from them and printed in the Review and Herald, a practice continued by Adventists through Reconstruction. William H. Seward, who reintroduced the higher law theory in the late 1850s, was reprinted in the Adventist journal prior to the 1860 election. Thaddeus Stevens' acceptance speech demanding an emancipation now appeared under the title Bold and True. In editorials, Adventists adopted the Southern Rebellion rubric for the war and blamed a slow execution of the Northern cause on pro-Southern attitudes among Union troops, naming, naming General McClellan and others as protecting Southern property and returning runaway slaves. Seventh-day Adventists were largely not Garrisonian abolitionists who denounced the Constitution as a covenant with death and would disband the Union. Here a bit of Adventist sectionalism may have been operative, as the Advent Christians, centered in Boston, were generally Garrisonian, while Seventh-day Adventists around Battle Creek, Michigan, were shaped by the more moderate anti-slavery sentiment of Western revivalism. Thus, when Horace Greeley equated Millerism with disunion in the New York Tribune, he had reference to the Advent Christians, though there were certainly Garrisonian types among the Seventh-day Adventists. All in all, Seventh-day Adventists used radical Republican policies and press and congressional speeches to support their two-horned beast prophecy that the nation was in grave peril. Throughout at least the early part of the war, Adventists were not hopeful that a change to a more radical policy would achieve northern victories, free the slaves, and sustain the Union. They expected the Union to tear to pieces over slavery and the rebellion as a sign of the times and use the radical Republican platform only to the extent that it supported their doer prophecy of eschatological events. Thus, during the Civil War and with the necessary adaptions in Reconstruction, Seventh-day Adventist eschatology was poured into a radical Republican mold. I'll put in a link to what is Babylon? 
according to the book of Revelation. That's four videos now in an expanding collection in our Revelation playlist. I'll also put in the playlist itself.